This is my commandment That she love one another As I have loved you Where love hath no man than this That a man lay down his life For his friends You're my friends If you do what I command you Henceforth I call you not servants But the servant doesn't know What his Lord is doing But I have called you friends Hello, good morning. Welcome to Line by Line Bible Studies. We're continuing in Ephesians. So it looks very nice behind me, but in front of me there is a, a huge mess. And, uh, okay, whatever. Anyways, so we're picking up at verse 13. <coughs> And in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I, I want to just briefly point back to the 12th verse, because at the end of the study, I, I encountered this, and... Um, I was a little trying to interpret it because, you know, I guess whenever he says we who, uh, who first trusted in Christ, you know, I always think I thought, uh, you know, uh, the apostles or I, I don't know, but it contextually, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I mean, you could make, it does, it makes sense, you know, all oh, the way the apostles should be to the praise of his glory. No problem. But who first trusted in Christ, it doesn't mean in order of time, meaning like there's a line of people who are going to trust in Christ, and the ones who are first in line are the praise of his glory in some way that Paul wanted to remark on that was more notable than anyone else. He wasn't really saying that. What he was saying is, we first trusted in Christ, while yet all the things God had promised, his purposes are not revealed. We have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. And we have obtained an inheritance we have not yet seen. Before we received any of those things, before any of those things were revealed, ultimately, we first trust in Christ. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not the faith is faith is first of all things, but uh, meaning like um, God's grace comes first, predestination comes before faith. But in your experience, you first trust in Christ, then everything else is revealed. Even if you have like a moment like Paul the Apostle, uh, before he received, but even though he was struck down the road to Damascus, the idea is that. Before, the, 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 the promises of God, the resurrection, the inheritance, all those things come after you trust in Christ. It's like I was saying the other day and someone told me that they, well, someone repeated back some of the things I said and I realized they had a, a different impression of what I was saying than what I was trying to get to, which was not to say that people... Um, When I was talking about like uh, people who ha have faith simply without seeing evidence, it's not, or, or I was saying, oh, I forget, I forget exactly which part of it. But anyways, instead of recapitulating that, let me just say this now. You know, God, ha you know, like God has people who will put their faith in him with very little evidence. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's evidence. You got the scriptures. Some people won't even consider that evidence, and because they they look at it in a particular way, they look at it. It's not scientific evidence. 
Some people want to make it scientific evidence, in which case that's where we get into pro They are responsible in many ways for the destruction of the faith in our society by trying to treat the Bible as scientific evidence. Anyways, I don't want to get off on that. I want to say, you first trusted in Christ before any of the promises were manifest. That's what I think that he means there. Because there's all kinds of time. When he speaks in time, he's speaking in time of when you trusted in Christ as opposed to, I trusted Christ first. At least that's what it seems to me. Just like in verse 13 where he says, you trusted after that you heard the word of truth. Before you received the promise, but after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In whom also after that you believed, you received, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit is important. Uh, you know, I've had people comment on my videos when I did Corinthians, you know, like, oh, you know, um, pray and blah, blah, blah. And because the fact that I received the Holy Spirit in a powerful experience whereby, you know, yeah, I speak with tongues. I don't even particularly like to say it sometimes because, you know why? Because it's something that I opposed for years. And, uh... And I'm not, and the thing is, on a rational level, it's a difficult thing to explain, defend, or otherwise, uh, you know, account for. It wasn't only speaking with tongues, though, from my, in my experience, it was, I felt power on my hands, my lips, my ears, my feet, right? I felt this, uh humming high frequency vibration is the way I always described it. Well, it was just, it was a feeling. It was very, whatever. It was very convincing to me. And I, and the thing is the moment before that happened, I said, Lord Jesus, you know, I just confessed my sins and I called on the name of the Lord Jesus to send his Holy Spirit. And then what follows Shall I assume that is of the devil? That's what was my, the question I asked the guy. Should I just presume that was of the devil because it isn't what you believe? Because it is it doesn't match up with your experience? And what is your experience? Well, I just prayed and believed I received the Holy Spirit, but nothing, I, I couldn't detect anything actually occurring, but I just had faith that something occurred because... Because. That's pretty much it. Because, because. Because I can't find a scriptural reason to believe that is how the Holy Spirit comes. And you could say, like, well, Paul, your experience doesn't precisely even match what it says in the, in the scriptures, or blah, 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 blah. My point was that I, you know, like I said, it's like I called in the name of Jesus, and that's what followed. So that's who I follow. And I can say for certain that when I received the Holy Spirit in such a way, it acted as a seal upon me. It changed me fundamentally. It did not remove all doubt any more than Peter ceased to doubt when he walked on the water. You think walking on the water would remove all doubt? I mean, I didn't do anything like walk on water. You know what I mean? Felt like if I walked on water, I think I'd stop doubting, but Peter didn't. So, I don't know. I don't think I'm a greater man than Peter. So, I don't know that I, I you know. And I know how it is. I understand. I, I empathize a lot. I see all those examples that Peter had to endure, and I have a great deal of empathy because I see how I'm just the same. And uh, so it does not remove all doubt, but in a sense, it did tie me to the faith. While I could have doubts, my doubts are different, though. It's not like I doubt whether God exists or I doubt this, uh, whether Jesus really was. I don't doubt those things anymore. 
But I have doubts. I have moments of doubt. Like what God wants. I, I, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what, if I'm doing his will. I don't know if I'm where I'm supposed to be. I don't know if he's going to work a miracle for me. I doubt it. I still have doubts about, because I don't know at any given moment what his will is. So sometimes I try to have faith that he will do things and the things will work out. But there's a bit of doubt there. But generally, I do, I do feel like through the experiences I've had since then that as I go on, difficult circumstances are less doubtful to me than they used to be. And I have a tendency to believe that they are working for my good, whether or not it seems good at the time. And I do not doubt in the, way, in the, in the sense that I might say, Oh, why are you doing this to me? Oh, God. The Holy Spirit of promise that was promised. We believe, and after we believe, we can, re we can be, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I believed when I was a child. Like, I don't ever remember not believing. Like, the moment where I came in to believe, it was sort of like, do you remember when you started believing in Santa Claus? And that maybe that's a treacherous thing to say, talking about God. But okay, right? But do you remember starting believing? But because to me, as a child, God and Santa Claus were equally just presented to me as assumed things, and um, and so I believed in both of them. I stopped believing in Santa Claus. I didn't stop believing in God, though. When I got to adulthood, I I nearly did. Not exactly. That's not quite fair to say. It's not. I, I was nowhere near not believing in God, but I had very serious doubts, uh, which were growing until I received the Holy Spirit, and which and that that pretty much took care of that. The the doubts that were growing, my doubts don't grow anymore in that respect. Like, is he even there? Is there even a God? Those doubts have gone away and I kind of am amused when people are so certain there is no God and it's like really it's interesting how certain you can be you know it doesn't matter to you that you know like I've never gone to Egypt or dug you know I mean I, I've never dug in an excavation for some archaeological thing but when the archaeologists who spent their entire life delving into that subject come back and tell me like look at we dug in this place and we found all these artifacts and we think they date from this period i just kind of figure they probably at least know more what they're talking about than i do and i have a just a tendency to believe them i spent my whole life trying to excavate the question of god and understand it and i don't ask you to, to greet it with the same credulity you might someone studying a hard science but yeah, I mean, people who ha who know nothing of these things, who spent no time seeking God, a person, not a, it's not like a, something, a hard science that you can actually, you know, put under a microscope and study. God is elusive, or he can be. If he, if he wants to be, you can, you can just knock you off your horse. If he wants to, you can ride your horse to death and never find him. So... I think people who seek God tend to find him, but they don't tend to find him all at the same time or as quickly as they'd like. I got serious about my faith when I was 19 after a, a, a what is what I would truly characterize as a near-death experience. <laughs> and I say that jokingly because it was, I wasn't in the hospital with a teet, teet, my heart didn't stop or nothing like that. I just thought I was going to die from a drug overdose, that's all. I thought I was near death. So I was, I, to me, that's the only kind of near death that really is. All the other near death experiences are interesting. They call them near death experiences for a reason. Because you're only near death. They don't call them death experiences. You notice that? Not near death. You know what I mean? Death experiences is what people are claiming they've had. But they call them near-death experiences because they weren't dead. Not really. My heart stopped. I was unconscious. So? 
you know. Anyways, so I you know I know people have had what are, I tend to think of those things as dreams. You know, if I if I if they weren't all so differing and stuff, you know. Even you look at the, I, and I as I say that I realize I'm like you know Paul. People would say the same thing about people who teach the Bible. You're right. You're right. I suppose if I had an experience like that, I'd have a different perspective on it. But I haven't, so I don't. So I don't know what to say about it. I should probably say less about it. The less I say about it, the better. I should probably say. Because I don't know. I don't think you can hack God though. You can't just like. You know what I mean? Like, I want to meet God, so I'm going to get to a near-death experience and, and get close to him, you know. There was a movie about that in the 90s, I think, Flatliners. Where they were all killing themselves and so they could see what happens after death. And then reviving themselves after a certain amount of time. All right. But I, I, at 19, I got serious about my faith. And you could say I started believing then. Okay. But well, it wasn't until I was 31 when I finally received the Holy Spirit. So that was, you know, some time later uh, for certain. So, you know, I don't know. I say I was 19, but I was like, I don't know. It might have been right about my, around my 18th birthday. No, around around my 19th birthday. I think it was after I turned 18. I, after I turned 19, what am, am I just insane? I turned 18 in high school. It was in college. So I got serious about my faith. You could say, okay, well then, that's when you really believe because you made an adult commitment. Yeah, but I still didn't receive it. And I, here's the thing. I've been asking for the Holy Spirit to come into me and trying to believe it since I was a young teenager. Because my dad had said to ask, you know, and he, the funny thing is he spoke with tongues and he told me the tongues was the least of gifts and you may not speak with tongues and just trust the Lord and blah, blah, blah. And when I, when I, I, I asked and stuff and he didn't like oversee this or anything, something I, something I did in private, nothing happened. I don't know if maybe seeking it in private was a mistake. My wife received it in private, though, so, you know, hey. It just, I don't know, does it make it more compelling? I mean, I could I could fake something miraculous happening to me as easily in front of a bunch of people as I could. I mean, I remember people were very doubtful about the experience anyways. I think they thought I was trying to infiltrate their little church of 30 people. You know what I mean? And I was gonna. I was traveling a hundred miles every weekend to attend that church just because that's where I received the Holy Spirit. I thought, well, I should hang out here a while. It's a natural reaction. I, I was just trying to infiltrate. In, in what's going on here? I don't know what my wife is saying. This is how. What a mess I have. Oh, there we go. I, Coffee spilled bad. I need to, this is gonna be some. Let's see. What, what's the important? Let's see. Okay, problem. Hmm. I don't know what the problem is. So that's interesting. There's some sort of problem with the stream. Well, I don't know what to do. I am recording it, so. I'm just going to keep teaching it. It seems to be recording all right on this end. Except for the whole spilling of coffee here. I'm trying to find the phone in the major mess. So let's just continue studying. In spite of the fact that this is probably not going out live. We will... Uh, okay, we will just... See to that later. I'm going to just keep going. I can always redo this tomorrow. Okay, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Okay. So it was a long time later that I finally received the Holy Spirit. That was... But it wasn't just a... Oh, I received the Holy Spirit. It was a... 
important life-changing event in my life. And that's what the Holy Spirit should be. It should be something that is has the quality of a seal, has the quality of something that is not just, uh, I mean, not just like, well, I named that and I claimed that, and that's that. Because sometimes I really feel like, oh, now you have the Holy Spirit, and, <laughs> you know, I said, if you have no experience, you, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's, it's nothing. It's just nothing happens, right? Nothing happens at all. I just, I just claimed that I had the Holy Spirit, and it was so because I did it in faith. If I do that, you know, I just think that then i like, okay, I've got the Holy Spirit now, and I, now i got to try to figure out how to use this. I mean, it's just so, it's so, uh, I don't know. And I don't know that that's that different than actually receiving it sometimes because it's it is it's not something of using, but he he subtly guides you, but he was already subtly guiding you. But I don't know. But I think in some ways the experience of receiving him, just because in the in the in the book of Acts it's so notable. Let me put it this way: when people receive the Holy Spirit in the Bible, it was a big deal. It wasn't just something they did like, well, I'll just do it in faith and it happens. Something big happened in their lives. You know, being sealed with something so grand as God's spirit ought to be something significant in your life. It shouldn't just be like a, a throwaway thing that, you know, it's like, because ba baptism is a bigger deal because it's something actually happens. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit should be much bigger than that. So, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now that might be a difficult verse to understand. What, do you, what does he mean? Well, the spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. It is the down payment on what God has promised. We believed in him first before we received the promise, before we received the Holy Spirit, before we re redeem, well, actually, we're the purchased possession, ultimately. We are purchased with his blood. It's the earnest of our inheritance until the thing is redeemed. When something is redeemed, is like the idea of like where it's bought back. Like someone can be redeemed from slavery. What it mean, And it doesn't mean they're morally redeemed. What it means is they are literally bought back from it. Morally, rede moral redemption is actually a uh, not the primary idea behind redemption. Moral redemption is really more of a metaphor, but it means to be bought back from the bondage of sin. And the thing that buys you back from the bondage of sin is the blood of Christ. He has purchased us with his blood. He's already paid the price. But our final redemption doesn't really come, as Paul has said, to wit the redemption of our body. The resurrection is the moment when the purchased possession receives the inheritance. Now, the Holy Spirit is the earnest. Earnest is a, a, a real estate term, I guess, or a banking term. I don't know exactly. It's a term in, in transactions whereby you want to buy something big, you say, I, look, I don't have all the money right now, but I want to buy this thing. I'm earnest about it. And let me give you this money. This is the money that shows the earnest nature of the bid. That's what earnest money is. It's money given at the beginning of the sale to make, make the buyer or the, the seller understand that the buyer is serious. It's a small down payment, essentially. You, like when I bought this house, I gave the guy who was selling it a check for $1,000 with my bid. Saying, here's $1,000. Here's how much I want for your house. If he accepts the offer, that money will go towards the purchase of the house. But the idea is I put money up in front to show that I'm, I mean it. 
God puts the Holy Spirit up front. Our experience of receiving the Holy Spirit is an earnest payment on the re resurrection from the dead, on the redemption of the possession which God has purchased with his blood. And therefore, it should be something significant in our lives. It should not just be something that I, <clears throat> you know, it's not just like faith in God. You know what I mean? Like faith in God is not the earnest of, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not anything God give. Because the thing is, the earnest comes from the buyer. The buyer is God. Having faith, I receive the Holy Spirit, and then assuming it's there is all coming from me. I'm like calling down the forces of nature. Come into me, Holy Spirit. Ah, I mean, I'm making it happen. If I just, I mean, what I'm saying when I do it by, I say I'm doing it by faith. Nothing happens, except maybe ghosty things in the world of the unknown, the unseen, the unfelt, the unperceived. Like when I have faith in Christ, I have faith in him. Right? And that is my salvation. But the thing is, and that moment is a seminal moment. But well, Paul just teaches us that this salvation is wrought in God before the foundation of the world. There's all kinds of unseen things going on. There's more to it. Also, we're gonna we're gonna live out our faith. We're not just gonna have faith in a moment in time and say, well, that was getting saved and getting the Holy Spirit isn't that either but it is this seminal moment also in your life but it has the quality of something that is a seal it has the quality of earnest money on a possession if you're talking about an inheritance it's like imagine uh someone comes to you and says look at your uncle has left you a lot of money And I need you to travel far to come get it. You know what I mean? I need you to go get the inheritance. It's in a faraway country. But here's a portion of it. So you know, I mean, I'm not just saying this. Here's a check for $10,000. You know what I mean? Or here's a ring and a check for $1,000. Here's portion, a portion of the inheritance up front. So you are confident to make the journey to go claim what's yours. And that's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to function as in the life of the believer. It is a piece of the inheritance given ahead of time. So it has, should have somewhat of the supernatural about it. Not just, you know what I mean? It should have somewhat of something unearthly about it. This is my belief. Here's the thing. I wouldn't say this except that it happened to me. Except that I experienced the unearthly. It made me think about that passage in Hebrews where it talks about being, you can't go back, you know, like it's impossible to return to Christ, right? After, if ever, after having tasted this, that, the other, well, uh, after uh, partaken of this, that, the other, after having tasted of the powers of the world to come. You can't be renewed. You know, if you turn your back on Christ at that point, you, and now I see, I'm like, yeah, if I turn my back on Christ now, after I had that amazing experience, it would be like slapping him in the face. It'd be putting him to an open shame because he went so far from me already. Now, not everyone who speaks in tongues has received the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people just do it out of peer pressure. Uh, my wife, there was a lot of pressure on her to do it. I know a lot of people, there was a lot of pressure on them to do it. Because, but they didn't. You know what I mean? People would go to church and they would, you know, pray to receive the Holy Ghost, as they like to call it in Pentecostal circles. It was like Holy Ghost more than Holy Spirit, whatever. I remember some people don't like ghosts. It's like, whatever. It's okay. It's okay. To the guys who were at the King James, it meant the same thing. So, Jesus gave up the ghost. Because you know, the, the idea of, I, you know, I think ghosts are imaginary as far as like, well, there's, no, no, they're not imaginary. They're just different. 
There are ghosts. I don't think there's dead people ghosts, but I think there are ghosts. And they come from the, the past and the dead. Sure. But I'm, I'm thinking very specific. I'm not going to get into it. But I don't think it's like, uh, you know, dead people, dead people's conscious goings about. Anyways, a ghost is a spirit. And a spirit is r a real thing and can be, can take on, you know, there are many different kinds of spirits, you know. Greater and lesser, man has a spirit. But we are more than just a spirit. Right? And disembodied spirits are not powerful entities usually, except for the Holy Spirit of God. So, such a thing ought not to be... You know, there, there is sometimes pressure for people to fake it, all right? And maybe people do fake it, right? I don't know. Um... I do think that you know, every time I spoke in tongues after I received the Holy Spirit, you could say, I don't know if I was faking it, I was attempting to recapture the magic of that moment, but it was always just me doing what had been done on that day, but not with the power that had done it in me. Like I wanted to recreate that feeling of the, the buzzing, uh, vibrating... Mm, yeah, it didn't make any noise, but like my hands felt like mm, like like electrified, or I don't know. There's no other thing I have ever experienced which I can compare it to. Even I used to kind of compare it to like you know you hold a lawnmower for a long time and you take your hands away and they kind of feel that vibration, but not like that. It wasn't so tingly. It was much more gentle than that. It wasn't as though they'd been vibrated for. But there was something like that. My nerves were alive with this feeling of power. And it was a gentle power, an interesting power, something I experimented with at the time as far as I wanted to know what... Apparently, I could touch inanimate things, and it would not... It would kept tapping. Like, I would touch the ground, inanimate object. But if I took, as soon as I touched a person, it absolutely would just stop. It would cut off like, boom, stopped. And I'd take my hand away, and it would start again. And I, and I, didn't, I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. I'm still not sure. That was my experience. I don't know if it's going to be the same for anybody else. I don't know. Point is, whatever, you, however you receive the Holy Spirit, should be something like it, what happened in Acts, and it also should be notable. It should be something that functions to inoculate you against the most serious doubts that you could encounter. Where people, you know, people say, there is no God, and you're like, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. I've encountered him. And, the, you know, all you can, you can call me a liar, but you better, it'd be more right to call me crazy. Because I don't know, maybe I am crazy, you know, maybe I'm just insane. I would think if I was insane, it would happen more than once, you know what I mean? So. Anyways, they, sure, you can explain it away. And maybe there were aliens hovering and they were playing a practical joke. You're hovering just over that church and said, let's zap this one with the God laser. But, you know, I called on the name of the Lord Jesus. I think that the, he responded to me. And uh, I have no reason to doubt that. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints... Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And again, that was to the pray. Notice that to the praise of His glory. That's the same clause that ended with that. You, we should be the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. Wherefore I also, after I heard your faith, okay, we didn't. 
So I heard about your faith towards the Lord Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, and your love of all the saints, saints, <clears throat> saints means sanctified ones, it means like holy ones. People usually don't like to say, people like to say things like this, I am no saint. You know, because the, uh, you know, the connotation, right? And people hate the idea of being holier than thou. Though, in our, in our virtue signaling culture of today, virtue signaling is a form of holier than thou. And we, you know, this is what happens when you abandon Christ, by the way. I, I see this in our society. I see atheist comedians complaining about people, everyone being anxious to cast the first stone. Yeah, because you threw Jesus out. And when you throw the baby out, nobody hangs on to the bathwater. You, know, you threw the baby out and you expected the bathwater to remain behind. You fool. You want people to value things like don't cast the first stone and being holier than thou is disgusting. And you think by taking away the core of that belief, the reason for that belief. Because <clears throat> if there's no God, <clears throat> there's no reason for me not to just conceal all my true intentions and just go about living in the most Machiavellian way possible. There's no reason for me not to just want to see everyone destroyed who it stands in my way or who might surpass me or might whatever. Why, why not? If I can get away with it, why not? Oh, it's not good. No, no. If I can get away with it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If I can lie and no one knows, it doesn't matter. That's the truth. So, well, it's like, no, you're just clinging to the God you threw away. And here's the thing. You can cling, but there are many who will not. You assume they're going to all be nice, fake Christian people like you who are atheists. You know, they, they, I call them fake Christian atheists because, like, they act, they still adhere to much of Christian morality. Well, like, yet... They have cast Christ aside. And they and then they find the world that, that they create not to their liking. It's not so happy a world with people willing to cast the first stone it's at another sinner. You know, and them and people it's like, Well, I'm not as sinful as they are. Sure, I've got my faults, but I'm not as bad as they are. So damn it, stone them. Stone them with stones. Because I'm not as bad as they are. That's holier than thou in a nutshell. A saint, one who is holy, one who is separate, is an idea that Christians for centuries have striven for, though just as, look, if you believe you're saved, then you are a saint, whether you like it or not. Don't say, I'm no saint. You haven't exactly achieved it yet, but you haven't exactly been saved yet either. So, I mean, you could just say, I'm waiting for my salvation, and then you could say, okay, I'm, not, I'm waiting for my sainthood also. Fine. But if you're going to claim one is a right here and now thing, you might as well claim the other is too, because Paul is speaking here. In terms of promise, you know? I really like verse 14. The redemption of the purchased possession. We're a purchased possession. We belong to God. We have been set aside to be holy and, um, and blameless. That we should be bl walk before him blameless and holy in love. You know what I mean? And part of that is knowing things like, yeah, holier than thou is disgusting. 
my sins are you know should give me pause when I rush to judgment to judge another. But you see, in a society, we have an interesting society because they sort of cast aside the idea of sin. You know, and they're like, what, what do my little white lies matter to God? What do my little sexual indiscretions matter to God? And what does any of this stuff matter? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. Because when you think none of your sins matter, you become the type of person who will cast stones first. And ask questions later. Or examine yourself later. That's why. It's important people think about their sins. People only look at it outside of themselves. For thinking about sinfulness. They find it in the world. And, they, and you want to talk about nitpicky non-sins. The things that they want to destroy people's lives over these days are for their thoughts. At least in the Bible, when they were going to stone the woman, she'd actually committed adultery. And in and, and, and this day and age, they want to stone you for thinking things. Jesus, you know, they never suggested that a man should be stoned, you know, he might pluck out his own eye for his offense, but that's his prerogative. You know what I mean? That's his. That's something. That's for an individual to think about. And I'm. I'm not going to go into that. I have a study on Matthew. If you want to understand about the plucking out of the eye, the cutting off of the hand. If you understand what those, you know, metaphors mean. So after he heard of their faith, he ceased not to make mention of them. I'm saying you're a saint. Don't be ashamed. If you call yourself saved, then you are a saint. You're going to be a saint. It's the promise of God. I ain't going to go around. I'm St. Paul. It's just kind of like um, arrogant sounding. But you know, I've often said that uh, there's nothing more arrogant than believing you have the truth. As far as to someone, well, to from the subjective perspective of someone who disagrees with you your belief that you have, you have truth is the most arrogant thing possible <laughs> as far as that's how it feels it feels like you're so arrogant you think you have the truth but you don't and people when they disagree they're going to think your belief in your own rightness is arrogance So, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That's what he's praying for. I cease not I cease not to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayer, since I've heard of you. It means I don't stop it doesn't mean, you know, when he says cease not, it means I mean I haven't I haven't stopped mentioning you. It doesn't mean he's like, oh, Ephesians, 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 you know. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. You know, when I received the Holy Spirit, it was a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I started to understand things better. So things came easier. I, I would search for understanding and find it better than I had in the past. You know, with not, you know, and I had a lot of the word already in me. And the spirit changed my perception of it. And it opened my eyes and I felt like, wow, in one day, 
that so much could click was uh, astonishing. I don't think that's a necessary consequence, but it can be. And so that's what he's praying for for them that they're that they're the spirit that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, of Christ, really. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? See. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And it, the sentence goes on for a long time. Okay, well, we're just going to be good enough right now for not. Uh, I almost feel like I'm. I have to, I have to do this. There we go. Anyways, so I just had to know what kind of problem I'm having. As I was, I was continuing, I'm thinking, like, what if it's my microphone and my sound is jazzed up? Because that cannot be fixed by re-uploading the study. So that's be a problem. In which case, we'd have to just start this over tomorrow. And I'd like to start it over immediately. So, Okay. I make mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Father glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding. I like that idea. It's like the idea of an inner sight. You know I mean, like I can see with my eyes, right? I can see an object, but not understand it. I've had this happen many times in my life. I'm sure you have too. Well, you saw something, you're like, what is that? I see it with my eyes. I observe it. But I do not actually perceive it for what it is. I do not know what it is. I do not understand its use. Like, uh, you know, maybe open up the hood of a car if you don't know much about cars. I remember being young and looking inside and being wondering, what does all this stuff do? You know? There's still often small parts of machines that I'm like, what does this do? I mean, the machines will still work if I just break this off, but what is it doing? You know, it does doing something. Then just put it on there for like, yeah, it's just ornamental where no one can ever see it. It has a purpose. So I want to understand the purpose of God in everything. I want to understand, I want to understand what you know, I want to read words and not just understand the words, but understand what they mean. You know, I want to have the eye, the inner eye opened, inner eyes opened of my understanding. So I can understand better what is seen, what is perceived, so that it could be truly known and not just... You know, like, oh, well, it's it's made of, you know, like I might see this, it's made of wood. It's got a rubber thing at the end. It's got a graphite thing down the middle, but it's a pencil, right? I don't necessarily, but you know what I mean? Like per perceiving the fullness of what something is, is different than the sum of its parts. You know what I mean? Wood, there's a little metal band. There's a little rubber thing in here. What a strange object this is. And sometimes the scriptures are like that, you know, like we look at it and we see, we see the form of words, right? We see the form of words and it says, well, I know what first believed means. I know what the word first means. I know what believed means. I know what this means, that means, but what does it mean altogether? What is it saying? And by knowing that we can know Paul's, Paul's, you know, we can know a lot of things. But he's focused on the hope of his calling. I mean this. Christ has called us to something. Hope in Greek, I don't need to look this word up, is elpis or elpizo. I forgot which one hope would be here. But it means expectation. 
the anticipated thing, something anticipated, something expected in the future. We usually think of the connotation. Hope has, through Christianity, taken on this connotation of hope, you know, or like this optimism. And it's like, yeah, because of Christianity, that word has changed. But the Greek idea is just merely expectation. It is through our faith in God that we expect the future to be something better. Maybe not the immediate future, maybe not even the distant future, but the ultimate future of all things, the end of all things, There, at the end of it is something we hope for that is an outcome that is good. Right? Not an outcome that is just, you know, bad or whatever. <laughs> so, he has called us, and there is something at the end. He has called us to his kingdom. There's something there that we want to attain to. The purchased possession. We want, we want to be redeemed. Well, we, you know, that, I wonder about that redemption of the purchased possession. I cast that generally as our salvation. It is our salvation. But our salvation also involves the claiming of an inheritance. So not only is he redeeming us as a purchased possession, we are redeeming an inheritance as a purchased possession. The riches of the glory of the inheritance of his inheritance in the saints. There is a hope of our calling. There is the, the end, the salvation of our souls, the resurrection of our bodies and the uh the inheritance of the saints these are the things that are at the end of salvation at the end of god's calling you know what he has called us to he's called us said follow me believe in me have faith in me the gospel has gone out put your faith in christ and you can be saved And he's called us to that, but, but if our understanding is enlightened, we can see better. You know, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we will be like him. We don't, everything that is going to be is not manifest to us, but we do know some things. And the more we uh, give ourselves over to understanding or attempting to understand, I mean, I have to crack the Bible and, and look at it and think about it and talk about it to get more understanding. I mean, I, under, I do have some understanding from my experience in the world. But it's for, for God to help me understand, to put everything into context, into perspective as a Christian, I go to the scriptures. And then I can take all of my experiences and then color them with the scripture and understand in context what it all means. And that is what the understand, you know, having my understanding enlightened does for me. It gives me this understanding of what is going on and what is written. And it gives me this understanding of what my hope is. Where am I headed? Like, like it gives me a better, clearer picture of what that kingdom represents, what that life everlasting represents, what it might be like. What the riches are that God, you know, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Okay. But what is, what is that? What are treasures in heaven? Is it gold nuggets? According to what I can tell, the streets are paved with gold, which means very common. You know, the foundation of the city is all precious stones and stuff. Not very precious, really. The whole thing is precious in its way, of course. More precious than anything in this world is what it's saying, ultimately, right? It's saying the most common things of the kingdom of God are the most, are abundantly, you know, like the things that are most precious in this world, as far as riches, are the most common things in God's kingdom. Ultimately, in the holy city of God, the eternal city. So, 
So, what is the most precious thing in the kingdom of God? You know what I mean? What are the things that exceed the, um, you know what I mean, that, that, that thing that becomes common? What could it be in this world that's more valuable than gold and precious stones and pearls? And the Spirit is what gives us the wisdom to understand the greater value of things. Like love. You know what I mean? Like having love is precious. You know what I mean? Kingdom wherein righteousness dwells. Righteousness is precious. It's not easy to come by. You know what I mean? And people... And it's funny, it's hard to come by and people sell it so cheaply. It's like... um. You know when people win the lottery, the the the, the cliche is that they go out and they buy a bunch of junk because they don't know what to do with money, and pretty soon they're broke again, right? Because they don't know what to do with money. As far as you know, I don't know that I know what to do with money. I'm pretty terrible with it, as far as I can tell. I mean, I'm not that bad, obviously, but you know, I don't know how to make it turn into more money, which is a small miracle and a skill I confess i wish i understood or i could execute without understand without thinking about it a lot of people don't understand they just have instinct i have a lot of instincts too for good things i have i have riches in this world that some people with worldly riches lack and i pity them you know i mean like i mean some things that i have instinctively that I, you know, like, I can't lay, like, people have said a lot of things about the way I am as a father and a discipline and, and such. And on some level, it's so natural. And on some level, there are certain aspects which I think maybe I don't know um, how well I've done or whether or not I would claim to have done well. But in general, Certain things, discipline and inspiring, inspiring obedience. I have a very natural knack, and I prefer that over many things I could trade for it. And what I'm saying, you know, what I'm saying is like, there are things to be treasured that go beyond riches. I can see them in this world. And in the world to come, they will be even more abundant. But, um, you know, like righteousness. People have righteousness and they sell it so cheaply. They'll sell it for riches. They'll sell out. You know, it's the terminology we use. We say they sell out. You know, they had some integrity. Let's say, you know, just like, just talking, not godliness, but like just virtue, like music. They'll say they sold out. Meaning they, they, they made great music. And they got popular, they got a fan base, and then the record company saw them growing and that they were becoming something. They said, hey, we'll give you a bunch of money, come in, and uh, and we'll help make you even more popular. But what we're going to ask you to do is to write the kinds of songs that we tell you to. You know what I mean? And then they, because this is kind of what goes on, you know, we, we're going to... You're gonna write it a certain way. We're gonna you're gonna have this guy is gonna be your producer, and he'll help you make the album a hit. You know? And they call it selling out because they sold out their artistic integrity for the sake of a payday. And honestly, I think in that is a bit small minded. <laughs> as far as like, it's it's like let them sell out their their talents and I, I don't know I, I guess I'm just like well you know what else is it for? She you know as an artist myself, the idea that like I should go on starving for the sake of art, I'll starve for the Lord but not for art. It's really just ridiculous. For art, I am a mercenary. For the Lord, I want to be incorruptible. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Well, 
There's a lot to say about that. We're at the final minute, and I'm going to just wrap this up because um, I, I'm a little. I've been having a little bit of uh, because I was notified that there's some sort of problem with the live stream. I don't know what that problem is. If it's an audio issue, I may have to redo this chapter. And so I don't feel like extending it beyond the natural length. So thanks for joining us today. We'll pick it up with verse 19 tomorrow. And until then, have a blessed day. Thank you for joining me. is my commandment that she love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants but the servant doesn't know what his Lord is doing. But I have called you friends.